And we're back. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the Private Wireless Network Summit presented by Fierce Wireless. My name is Kevin Gray, publisher of Fierce Wireless, and I'm the host for this event. Our final session here is titled Advancing Digital Equity in Tucson and Beyond. Uh, and we'll be hearing from Melissa Asterisk and Tucson Juan Jr. at JMA Wireless, as well as Colin Boyce, CIO from the city of Tucson. Uh, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get things started. So Melissa, Colin, and, uh, and Tucson, over to you. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you for joining Fierce Wireless and JMA Wireless as we explore how private wireless is helping the city of Tucson, Arizona advance digital equity for local residents. I'm Melissa Ashurst, VP of Emerging Markets for JMA Wireless, and I am thrilled to be hosting today's event with two gentlemen who I admire greatly. Colin Boyce is the CIO for the city of Tucson and has been instrumental in ensuring no family is lost in the transition to digital education, healthcare, and community services. Toussaint Juan is a systems engineer for JMA Wireless and has been an integral part of JMA Wireless for over five years. He's recently been a part of the team implementing XRAN for private LTE with small enterprises as well as large citywide deployments. So you guys are going to hear Tucson and Tucson throughout this. So there is a difference between the person in the city, just to be clear. <laughs> so Colin, um, I find your story to be so inspiring. And I know you shared it yesterday, but I'm going to ask you, if you don't mind, to please share your background and how you ended up as the CIO for Tucson, Arizona. Sure. Well. I I am an immigrant to the United States and I came up in 1979 from a small island called Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean. And when I came up here in 1979, my mom, you know, she always shares the story that she had $200 and four boys. So a single mom, four boys, and we grew up in Fort Greene, Brooklyn. Um, in New York City. And what my mom did was because she just had us, she used summer programs to help with their taking care of us. So I would sit in computer programs and I remember being in front of Fig 20s and Commodore 64s and, and pets and I, I'm, I'm dating myself now, right? So people know I'm old. <laughs> and we were, we learned about computers and it progressed from there. And so, you know, what eventually happened is I, I went to Fairleigh Dickinson University in Teaneck, New Jersey as a, a mechanical engineer and then became switched to the electrical engineering program. And my older brother, who was in med school at that point in time, was Colin, you're an idiot. Why don't you go into computers? It's obvious that you love it. And I branched off and went into the computer industry and two my two older brothers followed me. So I'm the last out of four. And those computer programs as a kid is what made it possible for me to explore my love of computers and eventually become a CIO. And so I jokingly say this all the time that three of my brothers are in the computer industry and the black sheep of the family is a neurosurgeon in Grand Rapids. It is a, a beautiful story and I think it speaks to just the importance of these types of community programs. Um, you and I have spoken many times about COVID and the impact that it's had, you know, not only for Tucson, but for the entire country. Can you share a little bit about what the digital divide looks like in Tucson and how that's impacting your residents and your economy? Sure. So um, we'll talk about the economy first, um, because that's probably the easiest. And I think the bigger subject is what's happening with the residents. Right. Um, so the economy in Tucson in the middle of the pandemic, you know, city government are usually funded by one or two sources that I can I that I'm aware of. It's either property tax or sales tax. And the city of Tucson is funded by sales tax. So. You know, in the middle of the pandemic, everyone is rushing and they're buying hand sanitizer and toilet paper. But that doesn't make up for the fact that houses aren't selling. People are not buying cars. And those are the big ticket items that help fuel the city. So we saw a dip in the economy. 
And what we were having hard conversations with is, what do we do with employees that we can no longer afford? We have to, we're talking about letting people go because revenues are down and we are making difficult decisions. And in the middle of that decision-making process, it was, wait, my kids are telecommuting because we're hunkered down in New York City and outside of New York City for a funeral and they're telecommuting. What allow people that are losing their jobs in Tucson? How are their kids telecommuting if they're operating below the, you know, the poverty level? How about the fact that Tucson is considered one of the more poor major cities? And there are people that make a decision on whether they get a cell phone or they get internet connectivity. And the cell phone has a benefit for the family in the sense that if my car breaks down on the side of the freeway, I can call to get help. You, so they're making a decision of, do I do this or, or internet service at home? And cell phones win typically. And what we started to see was, we're talking about layoffs. We know that there are people that don't have internet connectivity. We're in the middle of a pandemic and we have to get updates to them. And now you have more people calling in. And we know that a vaccine is eventually going to come out and they have to sign up to be able to get connected to to get the vaccine. And so Internet connectivity made good sense. And, you know, I wish I could say I was smart enough from the very beginning to go, hey, CBRS, that's the way we should go. But I wasn't. Um, What I did on my side was I said, I'm going to use normal Wi-Fi. That's ubiquitous. We're going to get everyone connected. They don't need a device. And lo and behold, right, we were talking about deploying 7,000 access points inside of the city to cover less than 20 square miles. And it was there was no way that it was going to work. I spoke to a gentleman by the name of Bruce Hart, and he's with Bit Insight Group, and he said, have you considered doing LTE? And at the same time, I spoke to another company, uh, Dell, and they talked about you know, LTE as well. And I reached out to um, the OnGo group and they said, yeah, there's lots of players. They introduced me to the website and I stumbled across a JMA and you can't make this up. I make a call to JMA in the morning. It must have been six o'clock. You sent an email. (laughs) Yeah, but I think I called too, because when I called, (laughs) you and I spoke And it was this ungodly hour in Tucson. It must have been like 8 o'clock your time, and it's like 6 a.m. my time. And when you realize, you're like, wait, should we have this conversation now? And I know I'm an early riser. I grew up in New York City. And so we started to plan this project, and that's how we got introduced to, to the JMA world. And we started to plan this project with how do we get vendors in? How do we coordinate everything that we need to do? How do we make a meaningful impact to this community? And what we realized is we went from 7,000 access points to cover less than 20 square miles to covering right over 30 something square miles with only 40 locations in the same budget. and while we don't have the amount of people connected to the network, the network that we were hoping to have, we are able to connect of uh, the vast majority of it. And we're about to circle back and re-advertise. So today we're helping right around a thousand people. And the goal is to re-advertise to see if we can double those numbers and get more people connected. And not only is the solution doing that, is helping fuel our smart city initiative. So. You know, yeah, we took Tucson, Arizona. That was the bunt of a joke uh, for Martin Lawrence from the first time I've heard about it to now people know about Tucson and we're doing something that's ambitious. It was an absolute pleasure to work with you on this. I'll just say that, that, you know, I was I was searching for a partner to help go down this path. And myself and the rest of JMA, we are just thrilled that we got to be a part of this project with you. Tucson, um, Colin just spoke a little bit about Wi-Fi versus CBRS. Can you kind of help explain to us why Wi-Fi isn't necessarily the most effective way of expanding coverage? Uh, absolutely. So, well, 
let's start off with what CBRS is. CBRS uh, was in 2020. CBRS was uh, essentially delivered from from the uh, FCC, essentially saying that there's 150 megahertz of spectrum available for private wireless or private LTE networks. In co in context of the 150 megahertz, in '96, I was with an operator and they launched a, a really a 1.5 G network with just 10 megahertz. So that just goes to how much spectrum is available uh, that's uh, that we can use for this this network. So the, the new spectrum is really facilitating a transition from Wi-Fi based networks to a private wireless network now that is just a private wireless uh, LTE network. Uh, so cities like Tucson or perhaps small enterprise, even large corporations and military bases are now using this CBRS frequency or the band 48 uh, for this purpose. So it really makes private wireless networks accessible to everyone. And it can also provide network coverage, which increases the flexibility for existing network operators as well. So the back to your original question of why is tr traditional Wi-Fi not super effective? And I go back to three separate items that are reoccurring themes on, on why Wi-Fi really doesn't work as well. It's coverage, it's cost, and it's control. So when we talk about coverage, we go exactly back to what Colin mentioned. The fact that he had so many access points that he was trying to deliver, which is problematic when you have the logistics of getting that many nodes up on anyone's network. Because CBRS has greater range, you can now provide a much better coverage footprint at a much lower cost. We also have the speed. LTE provides or can provide you with a lot of speed, which is on the XRAN system, a carrier grade network, with, which you can really aggregate all the function that you have in an LTE based technology you have with the XRAN platform. And then in addition to that, you have the control. You have future proofing that you can do now. A lot of the times people think about a network and then once that network has uh, it's exceeded its usefulness, you have to replace the entire network. The control piece really comes in because now you're future proofed because you can now transition from a 4G to a 5G network without actually changing out any of the equipment. So now you really have a sense of a system that you've purchased and now you can really grow into as your features start to uh, go up or maybe more people get on your network and you wanna make sure your air interface is a lot more efficient. So, and, and uh, the biggest thing in my mind, whenever you talk about Wi-Fi versus CBRS, it really comes down to the mobility as well. You have seamless handovers, you have very mobile devices that you can use, and then you can have a large variety of devices that are connected into your network. So on a more practical side, you know, the margin of error, if you look at a wireless router, if you have at your house and you have a wide house, right? Tucson, the houses are more ranch style. And if you're, you put your router on one side of the house, you're gonna get about 150 feet from that and then your signal starts to drop off. When you're talking about a citywide deployment, the margin of error starts to become a problem. If they're not placed perfectly in order to get people connected, you're gonna get no signal. And so what we've realized is, and I don't know if I, we deployed devices and what this is doing is taking that signal that we're getting and converting it to more of a pinpoint or strategic Wi-Fi deployment. The other challenge that we have for most cities, and I've spoken to you know, other CIOs, Oakland County, Phil Bertoloni and I are friends. He did a wireless deployment in Oakland County, Michigan. And he said, Colin, it was the worst project ever. He said, once we, took, once we installed the last access point, it was time to start reinstalling the first access points and it became a perpetual project. And in this case, we don't have that, right? We, we have better margin of error in the sense that 
you don't have to have the exact spot to get the best coverage. You can get, you have some margin error of a couple hundred feet. Um, it doesn't take a long time to deploy and the support options become easy. And so I see one of the questions are managing the XRAN. Well, the XRAN part of managing the network is kind of a no brainer for us. We spend almost no time in that universe. Um, and then the core provider, because of who we partner with, they're managing the core for us. And so we spend almost no time and effort. So people laugh when I, I bring this up and we're going to eventually bring on some staff, not because of the core side, but because of the end user side. We brought on no additional staff to support the back end of our network. And today Insight is providing the front end support for when users are calling in. And the only thing that we're managing now is router replacements for the end user devices. And the, the neat part about that is if we're bringing on employees to do that, we're going to bring them on in a help desk capacity and just add that to the help desk function of the city. And it's simple. This is perhaps the, the cheapest deployment and the easiest deployment that we could do to provide wireless. The other thing, yet another thing, if we did Wi-Fi to do our smart city functionality, would be almost impossible to get that segregate, segregation and security that we're looking for. Today, this technology allows us to layer on different networks and have that separation of networks, and we have a much more robust roadmap. Um, everything from being able to connect these devices to, uh, I was hoping to get this done by today, but I didn't. We are also connecting iPhones and Samsung phones to it, and you will be able to place calls on our network which is the flexibility of technology was something that we did not, we underestimated, but it's allowing us to do a lot of things that we were not thinking about before. Sorry for jumping in in the middle of that question. No, I think that uh, those are good points. So the other thing, you know, like Colin, I spend a lot of time talking with CIOs and CTOs of cities and universities and K through 12. And, you know, everybody has this access to, to grants right now. And to your point, Colin, there's, there's a great way to use that for all of these immediate needs, but then going into the future, I think one of the great things about what JMA is doing is the fact that we are software based. So when it's time to go to 5G and you don't have money coming from the government to go out and make those major capital investments again, making that investment in the right solution up front, I think becomes really important to the longevity of these networks with local communities. So Tucson, can you talk a little bit about what that XRAN software actually enables for communities or enterprises? Well, it, it's a different way of thinking about a, a very deep network in terms of what it can provide to the customer. So when you're talking about software, you really have to change your mindset about what you're deploying for the customer. Our software is built on an approved commercial off the shelf server. So it really is a software solution that you can deploy for this network. Now, this really means that when you have uh, an upgrade path or when you have something that's robust like LTE transitioning into 5G, now you can easily upgrade that network to 5G when it becomes available. So the concept of having to rip and replace expensive hardware goes out the window and now you can actually support a network and update the network with uh, in ways that we're already used to. So everyone is used to their iPhone or their, or their uh, Android device that has an update and then there are new features that are associated with it because the hardware can support it. With the software-based network, now you can easily deploy on a city of Tucson level or even larger level you can support all the different features that come along with just the evolution of a product. 
So the 4G will become the 5G. And then when it becomes 5G, everything will be increased in terms of your throughput, in terms of your bandwidth, all those things that you can support without actually having to change anything up. That's why going forward, the software that you put on these approved commercial off the shelf servers will become a, a liberation for people who want to deploy private LTE networks. Right. And I'm going to jump in. Right. So I think to, yeah. the city of Tucson is this unique environment in the sense that while we don't have the population of the small town I grew up in, Brooklyn, New York, um, we are somewhere close to 500,000 people spread over somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 square miles. We're the 33rd largest city in this country. Right. So, you know, you're not going to get much bigger. And the, the cool part about this being a proof of concept here is we're looking to expand the network to cover that populated area in, in, in the city of Tucson. And we know we can do it. And what we need for the to fuel that network besides the X-RAN servers is just fiber. And that fiber connectivity is the heart of making it happen. And what we found in doing this is that we've had companies across the country that specializes in telecommunications and other things that are now asking, how do we partner with the city and do something where we can expand what we're doing with communications and bringing in business? So, yeah, it's it's cool. We're able to provide stuff for the digital divide. We're able to fuel our smart city stuff. We're able to help reduce the cost of the city going uh, forward. But now it's the mindset of this is an innovation that is kind of new. And businesses are now seeing the city of Tucson as being this innovative city that we're doing stuff that has never been done before. And that is driving now businesses coming into the city. And it's unexpected. It does definitely open the door to some economic development, especially when you start looking at the flexibility now of many employees to work remote and the opportunity to go back to, you know, the towns where they grew up or their families have roots and, you know, take that high earning job from somewhere else in the country and, you know, relocate their families to Tucson or other cities and have that reliable connectivity that they need in order to do that. And then also see that money go back into the local economy. It's it's a nice story to hear. Um, obviously, Colin, you've put some thought into how we're tr gonna transition Tucson from um, digital divide to smart city. Do we think that this is something that other cities across the country could easily do and should consider as they're looking at making these infrastructure investments? So the short answer is yes, I think everyone should consider it. And I think the, the big things, and if there's any, any disadvantage in the technology, um, it's not because of JMA, right? It's CBRS is limited in how much power you can come, um, pump out of the radio. And I, Melissa's laughing because we've talked about this so many times. And so if you live in a city that is, you know, you have good vantage point and good height and you can broadcast and it's not a super hilly territory, it would be amazing technology. But if, you know, if your city's extremely hilly, um, and you don't have a lot of city assets that you can use as as radio locations, then it's going to become challenging. And I think a propagation study helps with figuring that out. But do I think every city should consider doing this? I, I know there's some people in California that wants us to wire everything, which is not something we can do. But the advantage is we're about to connect 150 traffic signals and be able to optimize what we're doing with traffic signals. We're about to use uh, cameras to detect accidents. It's something that you can easily do to enhance what you're doing at the, in your city at a very low cost, at a very low cost. And why we made it low cost was we used assets we own, parks, 
buildings, fire stations, police stations, you name it. If it's an asset that we own, we took advantage of those assets and that's what makes it easy for government to implement these types of things. So Tucson, um, 5G obviously has a huge play in smart cities in the future. So do you feel like the investment in LTE today using JMA's you know, software-based platform is really that success factor that's going to make smart cities a reality? I think so. I think, uh, you know, what, what, what we can't forget is the smart city concept itself. There are so many different things that that opens up the door for. So can we really expand upon it and, and make this a part of every single infrastructure? Absolutely. Big companies focus on or major network operators. They focus on the bottom line. They focus on what interests them. But private LTE, which is essentially a, a local cellular network, dedicated to supporting the connectivity of a specific organization's requirements, completely independent of everything else that's going on. So if you go past the, the digital divide and then you start looking into the major uses of, let's say, what Colin just mentioned, the, the Tucson LTE network that they have, it provides educational uh, access uh, underserved communities, of course, will, will benefit from that. But when they're outside of class, you still have this infrastructure. You have a private LTE network that you can leverage against other things that you want to attach to your network, whether it's a transit system, whether it's emergency operations, traffic controls, uh, as Colin mentioned as well. So it really makes the infrastructure so much better for everyone and everyone gets to benefit from this new thing that is there that wasn't there before. So now you could securely wrap, uh, you could securely deploy new ca capacity for different layers of your network. And this is where the JMA wireless product really comes in. So you have the communication now and now you can expand upon that communication and give everyone more information so they can make better choices about what's going on in their network. And again, so many different things that you could do, you know, the uh, the, the water system or the metering system, or uh, perhaps better routes for your, for your bus system, or is a train on time? How are we gonna use that? All on a private LTE network. So it, it's very exciting. And I think um, eventually we'll get to the point where it's not a matter of if your city needs this, it's, we absolutely understand this is now like a utility. We have to have this. Right. And I, I feel like I'm jumping at the end of Tucson every time he throws something out. In the oh. municipal government space, we're seeing connectivity or telecommunications costs with smart city initiatives increase anywhere between 30 to 40 percent every year can't continue to do that, right? Because the end result is you're gonna to have to tax citizens more. You're gonna to have to figure out a way to be able to do it. And so that's not, that model is not gonna work. When we sat down and we talked about our smart city initiatives and all the stuff that we wanted to do, first, we had to define what a smart city is. And I think the connectivity piece was the backbone of what we needed to do. But what I wanna encourage everyone is don't think smart city is just technology and sensors. It, it requires that for connectivity um, and those are important, but I think that's one, that's only 25% of the puzzle. If you wanna have a true smart city, it's more, it's about the technology and the sensors. It's about the analytics that is connecting to the sensors, which means you still have to have that backbone, that connectivity. The other side of it is the crowdsourcing of what you're doing with your citizens, which this network does help facilitate some of those items. And the last piece is connecting the citizens in a meaningful way to already established services. And, you know, I know I'm, I'm taking it away from JMA a little bit and taking it really high level in what a smart city is. But when you start to think smart cities, start thinking about all of those four components and the connectivity piece will be certainly driven by something like CBRS or some kind of LTE network. Find a way to do it that you can maintain the network 
not just what you have today, but your operational cost is something manageable five years away. Um, I, I also see that there's folks asking about a white paper. We are producing a white paper of what our deployment strategy was, and we're going to work uh, internally and with, in concert with JMA and some of the, um, the implementation team and expect to see something out you know, in short order. Melissa, we're going to lean on your team a little bit to help us with um, producing that paperwork. Very good. And with that, we are out of time. So Colin, thank you very much. And Toussaint, as always, thank you. Um, time flies when you're having fun. Bye, everyone. <laughs> All right. Have a good day, everyone. Bye, everyone. See you, Colin. All right. And that's a wrap. Thank you to everybody for attending the Private Wireless Network Summit presented by Fierce Wireless. I would like to thank all of our speakers for participating as well as all of our sponsors for supporting. Thanks again. And we look forward to seeing you back here next time.